Welcome everybody to the webinar. If I could ask everybody to and to mute. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome everybody to the webinar. We are just uh, starting. So please let me uh, first of all uh, let you know about the, the whole series of the webinars. This is the first webinar in the series about uh, microfinance in motion. Uh, the topic of today's uh, webinar is uh, Pivoting, moving from solo operations to ecosystem-enabled uh, business models. Uh, and uh, we are going to have uh, three more webinars. And uh, the second one will be on the 1st of March, adapting, combining old microfinance business models with new solutions. And then... Uh, a week after, there will be another webinar transforming, turning microfinance business models into digital operations. And the fourth one will be a week later uh, entitled Innovating, Introducing New FinTech Models in the Microfinance Space. Uh, and the agenda for today's uh, webinar is that we will start with the overview. Uh, of the business models in microfinance. Uh, then we will move to case studies. We will have three, you know, three case studies today. And uh, then we will move to the discussion with the uh, speakers. And uh, then there will be Q&A for the participants. So uh, please, if you have any questions or comments uh, during the presentations, uh, please uh, write them chat and at the end of the webinar in the q and a oh. section you, you will have a chance also to uh, to speak to comment uh, we will then ask you to to unmute and you, you will be able to ask the questions in person uh, but throughout the webinar please write your comments and questions uh, in the chat uh, so we we have four uh, speakers today, uh, Piotr Koreński is the moderator. Piotr is the uh, MFC's consultant advisor. Uh, we have uh, Lisa Richman from Center for Inclusive Growth. She is the senior impact manager. Uh, we have Javiola Spachu from NOAA, the, the CEO of NOAA. Uh, we also have Ilya Revia, the CEO of Crystal, and uh, Theodora. Krasnatsova, uh, Business Development Manager from uh, Software Group. Uh, so that's for the introduction. Uh, Piotr, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Justine. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, first of the series in four, of four uh, webinars. The, the whole series is based on the research that Justina and I have done for microfinance uh, for MFC uh, with the support of uh, MasterCard um, the Center for Inclusive Growth, and Lisa will say uh, something about it in a moment about the Center of Inclusive Growth. I just want to say um, that the, what was the purpose of, of this uh, exploration, this research. We wanted to find out two things. First of all, uh, we wanted to learn something more about business models. Business, everybody talks about business models, but it's really, uh, it's, in many ways, it's a, it's a black box. So we want to unpack what, what it really means. Uh, and, and in particular, how microfinance institutions create value for customers, how they position themselves in the markets, how they deliver services. So that was one, and how the, the business models, the way, the way MFIs do business change with technology, with COVID, with, with everything that is happening in the, in the market. But also we, the other purpose was, because it was done during COVID time, whether the COVID had any, any impact or what impact had on the uh, operations of, my, of microfinance institutions and what uh, opportunities it created. You know, as we know, there's no better opportunity for change than a good crisis. And to what extent this, the crisis situation was sort of useful, utilized, applied by microfinance institutions. Some of the things, uh, Justina will put, uh, the paper is ready and available. Justina will put, uh, you will uh, put the link in the chat how to, to read the paper. It's quite long, but uh, it has quite a few, quite a bit of information. 
I just want to say that uh, you know the what we found what we found out was not what was originally envisaged. Well, there were two extreme views at the very beginning. First, that uh, microfinance is going to to not going to survive the crisis. This is such a big crisis that uh, microfinance is going to disappear. The other extreme view was that there was a, the, the microfinance will survive, but it will be completely different. It will be unrecognizable. It will be something that we have never seen before. As you know, obviously, none of these extreme views have actually uh, taken place, have uh, realized in, 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 reality, in real life. But lots of other things have happened. And the, the purpose and the, what we have uh, uh, captured in the model, what we want to present in this series is actually to show what has happened and what's happening and what's new and interesting. So that's um, the introduction. That's uh, the, the uh, I wanted to motivate the purpose of, of those models. And each webinar is going to uh, focus on something, uh, some different aspect of, of uh, the evolution of business models. Now, if we put, I would like to ask, uh, first of all, and first of all, I would like to thank um, MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for sponsoring this research and sponsoring this event. And I would like to, Usna, can we move the slide? I don't know if it's moving. Oh, it is. <laughs> I would like to ask Lisa Richman to um, uh, uh, say a few words about the Center of Inclusive Growth, why, uh, and with two questions, why microfinance and why business models? Of course, wonderful. And thank you so much, Pieter. And thank you, Justina. Hello, everyone. So as we mentioned, I'm Lisa Richman. I manage the Euro portfolio of social impact programs for MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. I'm very excited to be here today to be part of this webinar. and would like to thank MFC for organizing this series of webinars. So for those who may not be familiar with the Center for Inclusive Growth, we are the philanthropic hub of MasterCard. What do we do? We bring together the company's core assets, that's our network, our data insights, expertise, technology, and funding to build and to drive our vision of an inclusive growth and advance inclusive economies. As the name says it, our micro goal is driving inclusive growth. And I think we can all agree here that micro and small businesses are the catalyst for driving an inclusive and accelerated economic recovery from the pandemic around the world. Microfinance institutions, so MFIs, play a central role to this. They power micro and small businesses because they provide critical access to capital, tools, and complementary support services. And because of all of this, it's so important that donors invest in strengthening the entrepreneurial support organizations, such as MFIs, so they can provide better services and tools to micro and small businesses. Micro and small businesses need this help really now more than ever before. We know globally that the micro and small businesses have been hurt by the pandemic. Data says that about 42% of micro and small businesses are at risk as failing, and about 62% of micro and small businesses reported decline in sales. So the center is very proud to be a partner and supporter of the Microfinance Center, an organization that we feel is doing fantastic work with MFIs across Europe and Central Asia. And together we are working to strengthen and bolster the financial resilience of MFIs in Europe and unlock what we call much needed credit for these MSCs. So what does the work entail? What are we doing together with the center and MFC? Broadly speaking, MFC is building the capacity of 90 MFIs to pivot, adapt and embrace digitization, which at, all, at the end of the day is gonna be able to open up new pathways to growth. So what are we really doing? MFC is supporting and enabling MFIs to digitize their operations. Secondly, MFC is helping their members embed digital literacy and skilling into their offerings. Over time, we have seen very much the connection between digital and financial inclusion. And based on evidence from the center's programmatic interventions, we've seen that pairing digital as well as financial skilling with financial services drives the greatest impact and is really helping MSCs translate knowledge into action. Now, as we speak, MFC is helping MFIs go beyond just the financial services and is working on these type of elements of digitization training modules um, and helping MSCs go more digital. So please watch the space, see what the center and MFC is doing um, in the coming weeks and months. And lastly, through our partnership, MFC conducted stakeholder interviews with MFIs to better understand their business models if and how they've changed during the pandemic and the potential to create alternative ones. As Pieter opened, we're very much looking at what's the purpose, what are business models, how are we thinking about them? 
Now, you might be wondering, why is this important? Why is it important for us to look at business models? And what is the connection really with microfinance and MFCs? As I mentioned before, we're helping MFIs to pivot, adapt, and embrace digitization. We saw very much digitization accelerate during the pandemic. And by digitization in this, in this sense here, I mean it in the broadest sense possible. So very much shaping how all businesses is done from operations to market access to credit and beyond. This is very important for MFIs and for MSCs. So micro and small businesses must digitize to survive and thrive in this changing environment. Competition is growing, consumer preferences are changing, and more and more services are provisioned to be digital. However, they lag behind their larger businesses in the capacity to undertake digital transformation and adoption of digital technologies. For MSCs to benefit in the digital economy, we cannot neglect the modernization of MFIs and the wider network. So moreover, for MFIs, if they want to also continue to do business, they need to adapt and think outside the traditional models, modify, modernize, and adapt. So basically, both MFCs and FMIs need to evolve and respond to new challenges and opportunities. So that's exactly what today's webinar is doing. That is the, what the work that we've done with MFC and these business models is trying to understand. What is the business model evolution? How does it impact the micro and small businesses? How does it help the customers? So going from independent, self-sufficient operational models to as more collaborative models is something that is very important. So I am going to pause now, hand it back over to Pieter, um, and can't wait to hear more from these MFIs about what they're doing and how really they're bringing together different business models. Also, on a final note, if you have any questions about what MFC and the center is doing, please don't hesitate to reach out. And if you'd like to get involved in other initiatives, we're also available for that. So thank you so much. And Pieter, back to you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for the uh, for presenting uh, the Center for, for Inclusive Growth and my uh, Mastercard Center for Inclusive Growth. And, and so thank you for the invitation uh, to, to collaborate. I'm sure many organizations will be interested and stimulated by what we what we are trying to do here. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, to the first uh, very short uh, kind of overview of business models. As I said. We, we talk about business models a lot, or we think about them, but they're not really, but not necessarily in an analytical way. This, this is exactly what we try to do. See what what it really is a business model. What are the different components, and what these component, and how can we better understand using the, 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 the this, these different categories and put them into some um, more coherent uh, understanding of what it is. So, the the business model, if I could, can I give you? Um, so in its very simple form, the business model is a, is a design for a successful operation of a business and in which we identify the revenue sources, uh, customer base products, uh, delivery systems. But one thing that is uh, that we should keep in mind that it's actually different from a business plan. It's not really a simple business plan. Uh, or it's not really only uh, how we make money. It's, it's For me, it's something more. Um, it is um, how in, in business is how we actually experiment. So, for, you know, the, the scientists have, have at their disposal all kinds of tools to experiment in laboratories, but we social scientists have also all kinds of tools. Businesses really need a business model. Mr. can we have, I don't think the slide is moving. Oh, thank you. So really the business model is, is a tool to, to find, it's a flexible tool that changes and in which uh, we move different components of the, uh, of, of the business, which we just, uh, how and look for better ways to, to position the institutions in the marketplace and provide better services and create economic and social value. So what are the components? Um, so we have, as the basis, we use the, the well-known uh, business canvas model, but we, uh, we a little bit simplified it. Then we came up with six components or building, what we call building blocks of a, of a business model. One, the number one kind of crucial one is the value proposition. What is the, what is the value? What is the purpose of the organization and how the organization creates value? Then we look, second, uh, uh, what is the legal and organizational structure? To what extent the legal, those legal and organizational forms create opportunities or, are lim create, or are, uh, create limitations for, for microfinance institutions to operate? 
The next one is obviously customers. We are interested what uh, who the MFIs are in, uh, uh, targeting, what are the market segments, what are different uh, different layers of, of customers uh, that the MFI is, is uh, working with. The next one is activities. And here we talk about um, uh, services uh, that the MFI is providing to loan products, uh, in particular loan, or various financial uh, services, but also non-financial services uh, that MFIs are uh, offering to clients. Delivery, uh, for those who, organizations which deal mostly with, with credit or credit on the organization would, would mean uh, lending technologies, lending methodologies, how we actually, is it, is it relationship band lending, is it credit score, is it hybrids? Is it, um, so, but also op internal operational models, how uh, the back office, how the uh, institutions actually pro eventually produce the, what is a loan of financial services. And the final one uh, aspect of a business model is financing, how an uh, in, in institution is what is the revenue model? How is the, how, how MFI is making money? Is it sustainable? And what are, and how is actually sourcing? Where is the money coming from? How so? Those six components, in essence, can help us better understand how a, a business model of an financial institute MFI operates. And as I said, each of those components actually changes. So the value proposition, the organization forms, customers' activities, the delivery. And financing, they 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 change to to in various ways in different, and they produce eventually they kind of create different types of business models. In the paper, we have tried to identify six types of business model. I'm not going to talk about them today. That we see in kind of generic models that we see in Europe, and you you're welcome to read about it in, in the paper. What I want actually focus on a different classification, different kind of approach, which relates to uh, digitization. Because the, the digital maturity, what we have found out, the digital, the, the obviously, it's, it's, there are different levels of uh, what, you, what we would call digital maturity, engagement of institutions in the digital transformation or operation as a digital organization. And we have found out that uh, there are at least three different levels, the different ways. Uh, and then I call them uh, uh, analogs, hybrids, and fintechs. Obviously, fintechs are the, the ones which are most advanced in digital uh, maturity, digital transformation, digi fully digital transform transformed all the institutions or the ones that have actually started as fintechs, the new ones, and there's a quite a few of them, and we'll talk about it in the last, in the last um, uh, segment of, of, of this series. But there are also hybrids, those which uh, introduced a number of uh, almost parallel operations. They have uh, kind of fintech type, but also more traditional ones. And there are ones which I called analogs. So they are still in the old system but introducing various <clears throat> innovations, kind of peaceful, uh, piecemeal, uh, partial innovations into business models. So, so there is a quite a bit of variety uh, of, of business models when we look at it from the point of view of application of uh, technology and digital maturity. Now, how you, those institutions get to this point, how they arrive at these different types of model, uh, the, the different kind of strategies, they can be, we have identified four strategies, which kind of coincide with the, the title and the theme of each, um, of each webinar. So today, the most kind of ra radical is pivoting towards a, a very different way of doing business, which is based on ecosystems, but also there's adapting or transforming on innovating, which we'll, we will be talking about uh, next, uh, next uh, in the following webinars. Now, let me quickly uh, go to the core of today's webinar, and we want to talk about how microfinance institutions can move from what Lisa mentioned from solo operations to eco ecosystem based uh, organizations. And just to say, uh, if we, you know, if when we look traditionally um, <clears throat> in the MFIs, and not on the MFIs, but many businesses, they have been operating in a solo model, were self sufficient, producing all services, or everything is produced within the organization, all key processes uh, are done by one organization. There's 
almost independent of other service providers. And I would say I do, I do everything therefore I am. Although obviously MFI has existed and always operated within the ecosystem, but it's really kind of in the business environment, but they, they were, and still do many services are provided wholly by the uh, MFI. However, there is a, uh, but there is a, we're moving towards more ecosystem based uh, enabled <clears throat> models. By ecosystem, I mean an arrangement in which institutions, uh, more institutions than one, is involved and they are compatible, co compatible collaborative institutions are involved and interconnect and can provide uh, services a, as a group. And, and there is an interdependence between different service providers. So, and there are kind of dynamic relationships between uh, MFI and uh, other, other partners in, in the ecosystem. So, so moving away from this solo, uh, sy solo systems to ecos ecosystem enabled business models really is uh, driven by three things. In some ways, technology has enabled a lot. Uh, obviously, we, we have more opportunities now to, to, to collaborate. And also there's lots of special specialty services offered by various platforms and, and organizations. Secondly, there is a huge competition. So uh, solar models are, may not be the best, the most efficient and the most, uh, 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 the best way to provide services anymore. Therefore, the competition is moving to, towards more collaborative models. And also customers want to have uh, more integrated services. So there is a, there are, so the push or, or, or pull, it depends. It's probably both from solo to ecosystem-based models has, has, uh, is actually real it's, uh, and, it's, and it's happening in the market. Now, when we have looked at the models and in the, uh, what kind of ecosystem-enabled models exist, we, it, it seems that there may be at least three types. Apart from the solo, which is the traditional uh, that I mentioned, there may be, uh, in my view, at least three different ways. One is actually what I call process-centric ecosystem. The other one is MFI-centric and the third one is customer-centric. Let me just quickly say what is what. And uh, we are very actually fortunate that we'll have an example for one for each of them. So the, in the process-centric model, which is the most kind of traditional, simple, and what has been happening, we it's based on disaggregation and subcontracting. So we can, when we look at the whole process, as I we are trying to present here, a pro lending process from onboarding to credit assessment, decision, disbursement, and collection, we can disaggregate this the, the, the value chain of production of, of a loan or financial services in general, and and identify those components in that value chain that can be uh, provided more efficiently, better, cheaper by other service providers. And so, for example, collection may be uh, just subcontracted to someone else, or maybe, uh, maybe disbursement can be done by someone else. Maybe credit assessment can be done by credit scoring, external credit scoring. So we can disaggregate and subcontract. So that's what we call the process kind of centered model in which uh, MFI remains as it is, but some of the pieces of the, of the, of the process are uh, provided by others in a collaborative way. So that's one model. The second one is um, it's a different way. And it's also, uh, when I was, I didn't think about it before, but actually, <laughs> interestingly, it's also very well known. Um, and, and I will tell you, uh, for those people who, who know the history of microfinance, this is how Grameen Bank operated for, from the very beginning, which is created, uh, which built uh, an ecosystem around the microfinance institution. Which uh, so the MFI is at the center and uh, creates, but also links the MFI to other service providers either by creating its own subsidiaries or own or service service organization. For example, MFI can have a, a sister or, or, or subsidiary of leasing company, or may have a business services provider, or may have an insurance connection to insurance companies. So, but this ecosystem is built for the benefit of, obviously, for the client who can easily benefit or use services, but it is built around a specific institution. And also, as I said, this is how Grameen Bank was operating. There was lots of institutions and social enterprises built around and also 
this is a very viable and interesting model that, and we will have an example today, um, is one of our cases. So that's an MFI center. And the last model is, is probably, you, you may say more advanced, but, but here the, 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 the focal point is, is not the process, not the institution, but the customer. By which I mean that the, uh, the, the ecosystem is built around the needs of, uh, of, a, uh, of the user, of, of the customer. And think one way to think about it is a, the one-stop center. So for example, the customer may have in the in the customer base ecosystem there will be a, a MFI, but not only. We will have also a bank, a leasing company, a training center, e-commerce e platform, maybe advisory services. It may be linked to other informational services, advisory, government programs. So, that, but and typically in such uh, customer-centered models. And we, again, we will have an example today are built around specific uh, target groups of customers. It may be a, a custom, so the, this type of model can be for, let's say, startup companies. It may be for women. It may be women entrepreneurship. It may be for green, uh, uh, green enterprises or uh, green businesses. So here, the, 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 the focal point is the customer. So process, cust process, institution customers. So those are the three uh, models that we have that we have in the, in, in, uh, identified. Uh, we believe that there is uh, the, the ecosystems can solve better problems um, because they, there is more linkages, and there's more additional services. There, there, there can be business development for, so the, the services through the ecosystem are more uh, richer, more holistic. It's obviously in this day and age today, it's technically feasible. It's a lot of cloud-based cloud system with, uh, that, that can connect and talk to each other anytime, anywhere. And I think uh, if properly designed, um, because it's not a given, it has to be properly designed, it has to be sustainable as such, but it can create a competitive advantage and, and, and match the competition and better work in the, within the in more competitive digital environment. And the last thing I think that we want to say here is, um, is what is there anything else that we need? And obviously, that we believe there are benefits. And but we will, I will leave this uh, to, uh, and we can discuss the benefits and risk later on. Because I would like, uh, I would like us to, to hear what what our uh, presenters are, uh, uh, will say about uh, these benefits and, and how they see these benefits. So with that. I would like to uh, introduce our uh, cases, uh, how different uh, organizations, we have three cases. One is Noah, second one is uh, Noah from Albania, Crystal from uh, Georgia, and S Software Group from Bulgaria. Each will present a different, uh, diff different type. We'll start with Noah. And I would like to ask uh, Heriola Stachiu, uh, the CEO of Noah, to tell us how she has actually, I don't know if you pivoted, but you have moved and you have disaggregated your uh, process into pieces and you have engaged some other partners. So, Heriola. Thank you, Peter. Uh, hi to everybody. It's a pleasure to participate in this uh, very interesting webinar. And uh, I'm glad that MFC is uh, uh, it's, uh, applying and it's introducing time after time um, uh, webinars that are bringing out uh, the best cases from MFIs. And basically, we see them as a learning environment and an exchanging environment um, where we can really uh, learn from each other and uh, also improve our, our business models. Um, the the, uh, the way you presented the uh, the ecosystems, in fact, um, it is very interesting, and it is um, uh, more and more visible that standalone entities or standalone MFIs, are, as used to be in the past, uh, gradually now are less and less visible in in all the countries, uh, and this is. For many reasons, the markets are changing very much. Um, the challenges are very much different. Uh, the, um, uh, the customer focus is very high and creating best customer experiences. Now it's, it's a must because also the education of the, of the customers, um, it's, it's progressing very fast. The case of NOAA, uh, in fact, um, uh, it's, uh, I would say, um, a very, a very uh, 
unique model uh, in uh, in the Albanian market, and it is we, we judge it's very successful. Uh, and we hope we can we can share slightly with, with you in the next slide. Uh, a very uh, short intro about Noah uh, being the, the second uh, largest MDFI in the market and operating for the last 20 years uh, with uh, very stable business uh, operations and um, uh, developing uh, gradually, especially in the last year under the very fast moving uh, digitalization um, uh, framework. Uh, we have been, uh, since 2015, uh, uh, having in place a very clear, clear technology uh, orientation because we were, uh, uh, we were very much focused to the uh, end customer experience and with a high, um, I would say, uh, intention to provide very fast services, full automation of credit activity, paperless operations, credit scoring in place uh, to facilitate not only um, the decision-making, but also uh, to, to provide the fastest loan in the market. Uh, and this has been also the values that have, dri have driven NOAA uh, permanently. In, if you go to the next slide, I've tried to follow the same logic of the, of the process, of the credit process to be in line. And I wanted to share with you what we do today. Definitely that uh, until certain years ago, we were providing everything in-house. So the onboarding of the customers, the credit assessment, the credit decision, the disbursement flow, and definitely the collection. Uh, but year after year, because we wanted to have more focus in customer service rather than processes that take time, are, are time consuming and are of, a, I would say, uh, can be provided by alternative ways in the market we have differentiated ourselves and we have established partnerships with different entities in the local market um, in order to get the best advantage and to get the optimization of, of the services. Uh, I've tried to show here in the slides uh, exactly how these processes are managed currently in NOAA. And then I will, I will jump to the next slide of the services introduced from the pandemic that we have decided then to keep it as best experiences even for, for the future. So currently, uh, we have around 40% of our loan applications coming from loan officers in the branch, 27% coming from digital marketing, social media, and our web, so distant um, uh, uh, applications, 13% of the applications from hunting strategies from our contact point. Um, we have developed in the last two years also another channel for receiving, for, for the onboarding of, of the customers, which is the business partners network. How this network works. Uh, we work with different retail shops in the market or uh, 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 different um, business partners, agro-businesses agro that are selling also agro-mechanics. And they refer to us customers that are having a clear need for buying an equipment um, to, their, to their shops. And these cases are referred and are introduced in our, in our uh, um, internal uh, softwares. And we process the loans in distance through credit scoring and through uh, internal evaluations. Uh, and this has started to uh, gradually become a very important um, onboarding tool because it is also less costly and very short in time. And it is exactly identifying the need of the customer. I have to say it's also one of the best performing in terms of portfolio quality uh, when we, we do our, our portfolio quality assessments. If we go to the credit assessments, uh, it is managed fully in-house. We have not chosen to externalize it, but 55% it is um, uh, evaluated through our loan officers, underwriters, and the credit committees in place. 45% through an automated credit scoring that we have introduced since 2018 and we gradually develop it based on the behavior of our loan portfolio. Uh, the credit decision, it is by the credit committees of NOAA and 55% and 45, as I mentioned, the automatic credit scoring. If it's scored green, so the loan is approved and goes to the customer. Uh, if it is orange, we do some more assessment and an on-site verification. So different tools for, uh, for improving our credit decision, but also uh, to have the approval ratios um, uh, within our requirements. Um, in terms of disbursements, we have 50% of the disbursements of NOAA at branch level. It's quite very much still difficult to uh, uh, get the customers out of the branches, and it is one of our targets, in fact, 
and 50% uh, of the loans, uh, it is disbursed through bank accounts. Um, we have um, also uh, projecting some uh, uh, another project with another uh, payment operator in the in the local market, but I will be there uh, by the end of the of the explanation. Uh, the in terms of the collection processes, um, sixty percent of the collection collection is done by our resources by our loan by our collection officers. They are a separate team from the loan officers, being in charge only on the portfolio at risk. And 20% um, uh, of the collection, sorry, it is managed through um, uh, outsourced um, uh, partners, which are uh, experts in the, in the field collection and have much more means than us to be present in the field. 20% other, it is done through uh, uh, external execution offices because this is based on the process of the loan and based on the progress or the degree of the, uh, of the case. Um, in the recent years, from April 2020, in fact, we have been elaborating um, uh, the uh, process of cooperation with uh, another uh, operator in the market, licensed for payment operations, which is EasyPay. Uh, currently, with EasyPay, we have outsourced 20% of the, of the uh, collections, the re receipt, receipt of the collections. Um, the customers, um, not having very easy access to our branches spread around the whole country, uh, make advantage of the offices of uh, this partner, which are more than 460 uh, throughout the whole Albania, and they can do their repayments uh, for, the, uh, for the loan to this partner uh, in a very easy way and very fast. With EasyPay, we are in, we have in project currently uh, to um, develop two other new services. In fact, apart from the disbursements, we are starting now within March to launch the onboarding of the customers, all the time thinking uh, of the uh, extensive network that they have in every rural area or urban area, uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, away from uh, the reach, reachability of our people or of our branches. Uh, definitely the second uh, uh, project in process that we have and we intend to launch within March, this is completely a new service not related to the credit activities of NOAA. It is the provision of the payment services for our customers uh, under the uh, infrastructure of this day using their own systems and operating as their agent for the payment services. Uh, currently, they provide more than 36 utility payments, tax payments, and all these things that facilitate the life of a small business for repayment. And considering uh, this cooperation, we, we thought we might exchange and might get more, more beneficial uh, from, from extending also that service to our customers. So whatever is in the upper part, it is no in-house. Whatever is in the second part of the graph, it is outdoor service to, the, uh, to our partners, definitely. And if we go to the next slide, thank you, Christina. Uh, how it started, in fact, with EasyPay, because it was really an experience started in the most difficult moment when everybody was um, uh, under the uh, first effect and the distraction of, of the pandemic. Uh, we had uh, two to three weeks, very fast uh, projects implemented with them. And by mid-April, we were able uh, to um, uh, provide the collection of the uh, loan installment of our customers through their, um, through their agents spread throughout the country. Why it was important? Because during the pandemic, the mobility of the people uh, in Albania is in any any other country in the world was very much limited. So to be to have operations only for two hours, it was quite impossible for a customer that was far away from our branch to come and to repay the installment. So the, the, the only solution we thought at that moment it was to uh, enable the, the payments to be done through a partner. Um, as I said also before, in March 2022, we are uh, thinking to go and launch two other products like the onboarding and the loan disbursement. And uh, definitely the third one, which we see as an added value for our customers and increase the cross-selling and the, and the loyalty of our customers by the end, it is the payment services um, uh, provided uh, to them definitely. As I mentioned, it's a win-win cooperation because for us, uh, otherwise it should have required resources, internal developments in techn technology, 
infrastructure development as well, a new license for providing these services if we speak about the payments, which under the current scheme uh, and under the win-win cooperation we have designed so far, uh, has proven to be very fast, uh, very easy, and uh, quite beneficial for the end customer. I don't know if you have further questions on the slides, or we'll leave it by the end, Piotr, but that was all from Noah at, uh, in terms of presentation. Thank you, uh, Ariel. It was very interesting. Thank you for actually fitting into the, 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 the model that we have presented, because that's very, that's, that's, uh, very helpful. I have one question. How, how much did it help to internally for your organization? So is it easier? Is it faster? Is it cheaper? So what are the kind of internal operational gains out of this? Obviously, the customer gains, we understand that. But what has happened internally? In terms of um, uh, inside the organization, I would yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you finished or I interrupted you. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in terms of um, internal uh, organization, it has been to be, I would say, the best solution because uh, first, um, the, the, the resources that we have uh, increased, it has been on the, on, only on the back side of the company and we, uh, mainly in uh, reconciliation and very, very few had come. So people all and all. Uh, otherwise, if you were to extend this serve, uh, these processes ourselves, um, uh, definitely uh, additional headcount are needed. Uh, for the loan repayment, we saw a decrease uh, of the repayments in the uh, tellers in our uh, branches. So we have added some extra tasks for them mm -hmm. now that they have less payments to perform. So optimization of internal resources as well in uh, I would say operations that have more added value than just the cash processing. Um, in terms of the onboarding, definitely it multiplies our distribution and it multiplies the number of the applications that um, we can receive from um, uh, the public. Uh, and um, I really believe that coming as a need, because when the customers go to these points, they have a need. So coming as a real need at the moment, um, it saves a lot of time for us when we do, if we compare it with the, the traditional marketing of our loan officers in the field, they need, but they don't know if there is a need, and the need might come two months, three months later from the customer that they, they have met. So time efficient, um, uh, cost saving as well. Um, and from the other side, it has also, um, how to say, um, provided now with a higher reputation because the customer evaluates a lot the fact that they don't travel a lot. So they find mm -hmm. the service next to them. And this is quite the most valuable, I would say, uh, benefit and the help that this service has provided now in terms of reputation to the customers. Yeah. Thank you, Ariel. That's very interesting. I'm sure there will be more questions and uh, we're very interested in, in, in in, in this type of model. So thank you so much. Now I would like to invite um, Ilya Revia, the CEO of Crystal in Georgia, uh, to talk about how they actually, you may not be aware of this, but you're building, you, you, you are building a, a, an ecosystem, but in a, in a different way, also very interesting. And, and also there are benefits and a lot of gains for the customer and for the organization. Ilya, please. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ilya Revia. Uh, so, um, I will try to be brief uh, um, and uh, maybe leave a lot of questions for the participants. So, the, um, let me just in a couple of words explain how we work at Crystal. So, we are the largest MFI in the country, yeah, in fact, um, uh, and we are represented almost everywhere. So, uh, almost 50 locations, mostly rural or semi urban. So, we are not in, uh, you know, so much highly represented in the larger towns. And um, we obviously cater to that specific clientele of MFIs, which is smaller micro enterprises, and also those customers which are you know, not so um, agreeable for the banks because they request so much information from them and usually underbanked customers. So uh, over the past few years, we have grown quite a lot uh, before the COVID uh, as, as understandable. And our model has also evolved, though um, I would say uh, in an evolutionary manner. And um, what, what came up as interesting things so we, we could probably discuss is um, the following that uh, COVID has shown, and especially the crisis period has shown to us the benefits of that 
uh, as you mentioned, ecosystem which we've been building, um, uh, maybe unknowably, um, that um, those partnerships we've created, and in some cases, in fact, the subsidiaries which we've created, and I'll show that to you on the next slide, if, if you see that you could uh, please move ahead, uh, have really, really worked well during these times. So this is how we operate. You know, the, there was a crystal as a, um, so to say, a major core of activities happen. We are issuing loans, we do transactions with the customers, whether it's utility payments or um, you know, uh, standing orders, direct debit type of products. By the law, we cannot uh, do deposits or customer accounts in Georgia. Um, so um, the, what we came up with in 2000, uh, 2016 was the following that we partnered with a local payment service provider, uh, which is able to provide services such as, you know, current account keeping uh, uh, for the customers, e-wallet um, and, and services like those. So back into 2016, this was really, so to say, uh, just a, an additional extension of crystal services and capabilities to provide better services to the clients. Um, then um, a few years ago, uh, actually in 2018, the company has an, entered into a, a very interesting uh, market opportunity, which we saw. Uh, Georgia has, um, in the past 10 years or so, has developed a very strong e-commerce businesses. So a lot of you know, uh, B2C or B2B e-commerce sites. And obviously we, we felt that there was a huge gap for the MFI customers and for the MSFIs themselves in this market. Uh, and by the gap, we mean the, the lack of the financing uh, for the MFI customers, whether it's small entrepreneurs or just retail customers, or actually those uh, entrepreneurs which are Crystal's clients and they need to grow, they need to sell online, they need to you know, create an additional presence uh, not just traditional you know, brick and mortar shops, which they operate in. So we developed a, a, a subsidiary called Akido, uh, which is fully you know, working on e-commerce you know, uh, and uh, has developed an e-commerce platform. The way uh, this was originally envisaged was just that. This was a, you know, a, a separate channel for Crystal, wherein we would create a marketplace connecting businesses, customers, and simultaneously be, being in between providing the financing. So in fact, um, it turned out very, very uh, successful in the end and has somewhat built a uh, fundament or a base for next evolution of uh, what we have been developing and rolled out during the pandemics, which was online service of the customers. So traditional crystal years before operated in a regular brick and mortar model, you know, uh, a touch based relationship with the customers wherein the customers would come into the branch. They would, you know, uh, have a relationship officer. That's the way we usually work that your loan officer is actually your relationship officer with the company who would also be able to visit uh, the micro entrepreneur at home, whether to you know do the loan application for them or do you know the, the monitoring, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So obviously that model has own limitations as we all understand. It's quite uh, cost intensive. Uh, it is at the same time um, quite troublesome in terms of pandemics when you are almost on a full lockdown and Georgia was on an almost full lockdown for almost three months. So, um, but what worked well was that uh, during this time, we worked a lot on developing fully online and fully digital lending capabilities using Akito actually, which was you now e-commerce initially uh, to interact with the clients. Uh, simultaneously, we have obviously you know, extended our capabilities of uh, remote work for all our employees. So basically, everybody was requested to work from home. Uh, the branches were moved into shifts, but that was not you know, a major change in the business model itself. We had to maintain so-called hybrid mode of relationship with our customers, wherein they would be able to transact online and at the same time come into the branches if they needed to. Uh, what came as an 
interesting discovery for some uh, was despite this, uh, I, I would believe a hype maybe that microfinance customers are not tech savvy, it didn't turn out to be so. So uh, we developed very quickly when the moratorium period entered in Georgia and we had to you know, reschedule loans for almost all of our clients. We developed a very quick tool within a week wherein the client would be able to see the new schedule of payments, would be able to you know, accept or reject the prolongation. And in fact, 80% of our clients use the tool instead of you know, calling the call center or coming to the branches. So everybody was quite tech savvy. They had some other um, exposure to technology or whether at, at the FinTech or the bank or actually some other MFI. So that turned out quite well. Now, um, what was another direction we were already starting before the COVID um, uh, crisis hit was the need for, we, back in 2018 and 19, we actually saw the need not just for the traditional products, uh, such as loans for our customers, but also asset finance uh, in Georgia. So uh, we have started rolling out uh, a subsidiary called Crystal Leasing to provide asset finance products for agriculture, for small businesses. Um, in other words, uh, this worked well, real well for those customers which would like to grow those customers which are simply outgrowing traditional lending products, they, will, they need something more than uh, a loan, which is pretty competitive product in Georgia. We have uh, you know, major systemic banks competing with us, not just small MFIs, but actually very, very large banks competing against Crystal. And lending products have been on the market for you know, three decades now. Everybody understands them. There's huge pricing competition. In fact, almost a damping competition on that market. You know, leasing is an interesting product. It's for more sophisticated customers. So we rolled this out initially as part of our business, initially as part of an MFI, and then spin it as a separate entity uh, for those customers. Um, what I have to say that usually crises is like this, uh, not the greatest uh, time for developing leasing business. This is well known, oh. but we were ready for this. We were, you know, kind of anticipating that risk. Turning back was not, a, a, I would say, a good option because we would foresee that the crisis would end at some time. And mm -hmm. because Georgia is so much developing in the agricultural sector, especially for our client, um, you know, type of clientele, we felt this was a great opportunity. But uh, there was another, you know, interesting um, opportunity which we also saw. And that was related to a well-known adage of uh, the MFI customers. It's very hard to develop customer and not lose them in the end to a major bank, somebody who can provide more sophisticated services, maybe a bigger loan, better, I don't know, brand presence or whatever. Uh, at the same time, we, we saw that many, many of customers which were working with diligently, they were leaving in the end because we were simply unable to you know, give them business advice on how to grow their business or provide them with more sophisticated products. So in 2020, also right before the crisis, we developed uh, and spinned off a sub separate subsidiary, Crystal Consulting. And that subsidiary is fully focused on developmental goals of the customers. In other words, Crystal's customers or those customers that would like to interact with Crystal's and already have a functioning business, well, they're just starting up, but we see a potential in them. They can uh, attain services such as business registration, uh, which is a, you know, for some small businesses, they, they do not know how to do this. Uh, getting a tax ID number, uh, receiving accounting consultancy by Crystal Consulting, how to do your books, how to actually organize your systems and how to organize your inventory keeping. And this year, they're also able to, in fact, we, we do provide them with a software system and enterprise resource planning, but obviously a small one, not a major ERP software, wherein they can you know, do their record keeping do the full inventory management of what is it that the inventory they've ordered, how much it costs them, 
how are their sales going, do the reporting. In the end, we aim to develop this into a, so, so a demo, the idea is to democratize the consulting for the small businesses at the same time, providing inflow of such customers to Crystal and also helping existing customers to grow, to become less riskier in terms of the credit profile for them, uh, achieve better funding um, from Crystal or maybe some other uh, firms as well. So um, uh, as Pep rightly mentioned, I, I think we've been building this ecosystem type of approach, <laughs> but maybe you know, not with the original intention uh, of doing this, but it, it kind of came in very, very naturally for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it, we do also provide via Crystal Consulting training and mentoring services, which really coincides with you know, uh, a lot of goals of our funders as well. Crystal traditionally has been well known for uh, a lot of uh, funding attracted, not just from IFIs and DFIs, but also uh, developmental institutions such as United States Agency for International Development and those. And um, those agencies, they really would like to go in deep into, you know, regions assisting agriculture and so on. So that's how consulting helps by bringing on additional grants, which are developmental grants for the customers. And in fact, you know, uh, basically assisting the crystal uh, as well. The, the final building block of this, uh, this is the payment service provider, which I mentioned. In fact, uh, it, that is not just one type of, you know, one-on-one -on -one relationship with that PSP, but via that PSP, we do also provide such, you know, digital services such as uh, ability to pay without coming into the branch, ability to withdraw money without coming into the crystal branch via another bank's branches why another MFIs uh, transact uh, cashless operations or maybe transfer money abroad or receive money from abroad. So basically that um, somewhat is uh, building the entire uh, model of, of the way that a crystal conducts business. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ilya. I, I, is that all what you wanted to say? <laughs> Just be, <laughs> well, um, maybe um, what uh, what I could mention is a couple of things how it helped us during the COVID. And, uh, oh, excellent, excellent. Um, very interesting how how it, how it worked. Now, initially, when we, obviously this was an unprecedented crisis for us, and nothing alike, anything else uh, in Georgia, uh, and uh, we were hit with a lot of questions internally on how we should work. Now, the, the country was on complete lockdown. We couldn't even move by car. The customers in the small villages, they could still at least you know, come to the branches, but we didn't want them to. Um, and we had to protect employee safety and so on and so on. So uh, ability, you know, having those services, having that online platform, having a relationship with a PSP, uh, actually a strategic relationship with that PSP really helped in, you know, not um, risking too much with uh, whether it's employees, whether having lines in the branches or, um, you know, for, for our customers and making it more convenient for them to repay their liabilities after the moratorium or actually find out the status of their liability was crystal. So uh, it worked well also for the bus uh, business clients, those that already had a functioning SME, they were able to see the, you know, all the loan balances, the to apply for uh, prolongation or actually opt out from the prolongation because many, many businesses in Georgia, they didn't have an issue because they, they were not affected. Um, so roughly 20% of our customers continue paying as they were without any issues right at the uh, onset of the crisis and uh, continue to doing so. So um, that was very you know, interesting developments on how this kind of helped us and having this digital arm uh, you know, kind of assisted uh, our regular business uh, wherein we have this relationship-based model um, in the end.
-hmm. Now, uh, obviously, this, this didn't come up without a cost. It requires some investment, which is usually the major, you know, uh, digital in, digitalization. It, it, it's never too cheap, but it, it brings a lot of benefits. So that's uh, something which uh, we've highly understood and have always um, paid attention to. Um, so I'm open for questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ilya. It's very interesting how how you, you have indeed you have built an ecosystem from the point of view what what the customer can what kind of services the MFI can provide or extended services, but not necessarily through as MFI, but through subsidiaries or partners. I have just a quick question if you could uh, to clarify the entry points for customers. So if I'm a customer, if I'm just not a customer of Crystal yet, I have not taken any loans, but can I use the consulting services and can, can I use, you know, can I move between those different entities? Yes. Yes, of course, there is no requirement. So you can use, <clears throat> use e-commerce website and buy something from the merchant which is registered at that e-commerce and you can use our financing or you can mm -hmm. pay the card or you can make a wire transfer. Uh, you can obviously use a payment service provider just doing transactions and they have a fully open system. Mm -hmm. uh, well, leasing, you have to, I mean, if, if you're coming for the first time, you will become the customer of Crystal Leasing and only if you sign the documentation that you'd also like to be a customer of MFI. Okay. So there are various various ways how the customer can interact within this within the system. Yes, it's fully open and okay. you can mix and match the products. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting model, uh, which shows that you can enhance the services and build the services, variety of services for the customer uh, around MFI. So thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be more questions and we'll come back to the benefits and, and risk. I have some questions about risk. But if I, for the in the interest of time, I would like to move to the third model just to remind uh, uh, what we that we have the, the model that we could consider the most kind of advanced or, or which I call customer centric where service where you will give the create a platform for the purpose of of the customer to be able to access variety of services slightly in a different way um, not to say that what we have just said was not actually done with the intention of uh, or, or to serve the customer but I think the approach is slightly uh, slightly interesting. So I would like to ask uh, Theo, um, Theodora Krastanova from the software group to tell us and show, uh, show us how they have actually developed and launched a, a platform that is uh, customer centric. So Theodora, please. Thank you, sure. Okay, uh, before sharing my screen and showing you some uh, some interesting screens, I will just make the disclaimer. So unlike uh, Noah and Crystal, I'm not representing a microfinance company, but uh, we in software group as a technology provider, we have the same, the same mission and um, how to say, uh, we breathe with the same air as the microfinance uh, companies. That is why we are also a member of uh, MFC for so many years. So I'm going to show you, um, okay, so, but I don't have the right to share my screen. Maybe if you can. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, but you muted yourself for a moment. Okay. okay sorry. I just uh, tried to share my screen, but I don't have the right. So one second. I will just check because I stopped sharing. So you should be able to, uh, to share it. I think that host disabled participant screen sharing. So probably you have to give me some access. One second. So I'm going to show you a project that was the idea for which was born during the most difficult and unsecure COVID times. And uh, it managed to went to go live uh, three, four months ago. So uh, we are very excited uh, here in Bulgaria that we already uh, have such kind of a platform, but I'm still not able to- Okay, check. and how about now? Can you check now? Because I made you a moderator. Yes, now I can. Just let me know if you see my screen already. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So still the platform is only in Bulgarian language. Uh, currently, uh, the English translations are being processed, but I can use this fancy Google Translate for the whole 
uh, website so that I can show you uh, very quickly. So this is the home page of the Business Booster. Uh, this is a platform owned and um, maintained by the Bulgarian Development Bank and uh, BDB Microfinance, their associated microfinance company. Uh, so we are just a technology, technology provider and um, all the information around and so on is provided by BDB. We help with the user journeys and so on and building it. So as you can see here, you can see that there are a lot of different sections. So we have the Business Academy where there are a lot of guidance and step-by-step, um, -step, uh, how to say, uh, guides how to start a business, how to grow a business and so on about financial literacy and um, other, other educational materials that might be needed for a, a micro and small uh, sized uh, businesses. So maybe just to briefly tell you that here in Bulgaria, it's a total nightmare to start a business in terms of legal and organizational point of view. And then uh, for BDB and uh, their microfinance company as, uh, as a mission and um, help say um, responsibility to drive the business and the economy in Bulgaria, it was very difficult to, uh, to serve all this uh, niche in COVID times because BDB and the microfinance company are situated in Bulgaria, uh, in Sofia, they're concentrated in the capital. So it was difficult for them to serve the rural areas and uh, uh, businesses that are outside uh, the city. And even in the city during the lockdown, it was also impossible to, to serve them. So the idea was born. Uh, the success story section was about the new, uh, how to say, the newly unemployed and other people that want to start their own business just to see what other people did in different parts of the country. So maybe they can just um, find something that they can also do in their small city and, and so on. Then there is the section for the financing. So the, the thing that helps actually uh, the companies to, to start the business, to grow and so on. So here we have different types of uh, financing. And then we have the e-marketplace where everybody can build their own online shop with the whole uh, administration of it and so on to have uh, their own uh, URL name and so on. All this is accessible through the login page. So here I have this uh, login credentials. I can get in and I can do several things. So first I can have something saved here in my favorite so different guides or articles I can build my online shop and then I can create a business plan which is actually maybe the one of the the most uh, how to say uh, value, valued things here because for the people who are just starting a business, it's usually very difficult and almost impossible to create a real business plan that will be accepted by the financial institution and that will give them really the perspective of building this business. So here what we did, we just did a wizard that is leading the customers through some some fields and uh, sections, and then is generating the, the real business uh, business plan on a PDF or Word uh, version so that they can use it and uh, um, apply with it for a business loan. I will not go through the whole process as, as it's uh, pretty, pretty long. Uh, another very important thing to mention here is the is Vicky. This is our digital um, business assistant. And uh, if you don't know what you're doing here, Vicky can lead you through very, how to say, user-friendly uh, wizard, asking you several questions and 
according to the answers, she will give you the, the specific part of the platform that, uh, that you need. For example, now my answers are getting me to, to a loan, but I can apply now. And then with this application, I'm triggering the real process on the in the back office. So the, the BTP uh, employees and um, the microfinance company will receive my application and uh, this will go into the, um, the next uh, process for approval and so on. Uh, the Viki wizard can lead me to a guide how to start a business in 10 days, for example, or something else depending on my, on my answers. So here the idea was just to give the, the space for the small and micro businesses and for the people who want to start a business that they have the, the ambitions, they have the digger, but don't know where to start from. So to give this space and help this, uh, this sector to, to do the things with a little bit uh, more ease. So to show them that it's not so, um, so frightening and so difficult. And then... BDP and the microfinance company can receive with these really qualified leads because the journeys here are structured in a way that you don't directly apply for a loan, but you go through different journeys, different sections of the platform. And at the end, if you really need a loan, you will get to this point and uh, naturally, and you will apply for it. So uh, we removed a little bit this generic uh, clicking and uh, asking for, uh, for a loan. So this is in very brief. So it's a, with a very big potential for adding different um, other services, not only the, the business economy and the market and uh, the financing, but also different other tools like, for example, uh, some uh, basic CRM um, functionality or accounting module or something else that most of the micro and small enterprises need in their everyday business. And uh, they cannot uh, really afford to purchase a separate uh, system or to maintain heavy, um, heavy servers and so on. But this is for, for the future, for the future potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Teodora. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. It's, it's an example of, a, of an ecosystem that is built around the needs of the customer. And I understand this is mostly and purely, if not purely, but mostly for the people who start or early stage businesses. Uh, correct? Yeah. And my, my question to you, how would an MFI be connected with it? So I understand it's uh, for now it's, it's been designed for the Business Development Bank of Bulgaria. For the Development Bank of Bulgaria, but but I, and, and they are MF, MFI that they own, but it can be open to obviously other banks, right? Yes. So how how would the MFIs be could it kind of become a part of it, and if, or what else could you add to this platform? So here the 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 more how to say future um, proof idea is that. Uh, more MFIs can join can join the platform. Mm -hmm. um, they will receive some kind of administration uh, rights and uh, to a specific part of the platform, and then their and their products will come here. For example, here we have micro loans, and micro loans are for are different type for example startup loan or there is another um, type of business loan and so on so they will come here and will add diversity for the for the end customers and depending on this so here the models can be different they can be for example now they're hidden you don't really um have in front of your eyes to who you're applying for because as a customer it doesn't matter to you since you're applying for something that you really need and it's according to your uh, to your particular needs and uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of the things and then the other the other part is that in this business academy part there are a lot of contributors for example here in short term will be added the association for small and micro and small enterprises in Bulgaria that will add content to the video tutorials and to the guides as well. So here the idea is to mm -hmm. 
start this um, this uh, learning and uh, academy section with more relevant information and guidance. For example, now there are few tutorials, mm -hmm. tutorials made with very uh, how to say customer centric approach. So explaining them real things and how really to finance the business or how to build the business plan and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the, the idea for the upcoming future. Okay, thank you very much. It was, so we have heard three um, different um, <clears throat> kind of uh, approaches to building ecosystems and each of them is um, obviously looking at customers, looking at internal efficiency, but, but slightly in a different way. One from, we, we talked about the, the process, how we design the disaggregate and subcontract pieces of the process, how we can create ecosystem and our microfinance institution, how we create a, a, around um, a strictly a specific need of, of a customer. And all of these uh, I, I can be combined. It's not like the, the, there is no connection between them. The, there's always a possibility that that these models can actually overlap and can be inter in intertwined or interlinked between themselves. I would like to go back for a moment to, to our speakers and maybe starting with uh, Hariola and uh, is to ask what, um, what risks do you see? I mean, we've seen quite a bit of benefits. We talked about benefits, but you know, including uh, easy pay as, as a provider, well, they can collapse, they can, they can stop operating. Uh, they, they may actually poach and take your customers away. They may start you know, they maybe become a competitor in some ways. Where do you see those risks in this approach and how do you manage those risks? Because to what extent it, 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 it really weighs in the way you, you build those services? Ariola, if you're speaking, you're muted. Hello. Justina, maybe you can try to unmute her as a host. Yes. She must be. Hmm? <laughs> Sorry, I needed... That's, a, that's all right. <laughs> no worries. No, I welcome, needed the, welcome, the host. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. You know, uh, Justina was uh, controlling my uh, screen fully, and I couldn't also answer. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, so uh, Hariola, I'm interested in, in, yes. the, in, the, in the risks that you see and how you manage them. Um, in fact, um, uh, it, we have... Yeah, all the time thought about the pros and the cons of the model as well. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, yeah, thinking now after the webinar for the screen that you have built, I think in, in the center of that matrix, you should build the circle because despite of the specifics, by the end, it's everything around the customer. So whatever yeah. ever we choose, by the end, it, it goes to the, to the customer experience. Uh, definitely that uh, any, any type of change, um, it is related with, uh, with specific risk. Um, uh, in, in our cooperation with EasyPay, uh, the major risk that we, we have identified is losing the, the direct contact with the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, because when we push them out of our branches uh, all for the onboarding uh, and also for the repayment and for everything to an external party, somehow the bond with the customers might be relaxed, which is, I would say, one of the advantages of the microfinance uh, operations. Um, however, uh, this goes uh, alongside the education that the customers are receiving and the market is receiving regarding digital services. So currently they apply for address, for um, house appliance, for something from the home and they take it home. And this is an education forced by COVID uh, and started during the, the pandemic period. So now they are also educated and used with, with financial products in distance, but still there is a risk of losing really that, that tight bond with, with the customer. Uh, the second risk that we have evaluated, in fact, it is um, the um, sometimes uh, 
customers might get confused who is providing the service. Uh, is no one providing the loan or is Easy Pay providing the loan because they don't know really what's in the background. We are licensed for providing loans and not payments. They are licensed for providing uh, payments, but not loans. And uh, the, the right equilibrium in terms of, uh, of the proper marketing and the proper communication facilitates the customer to understand the work whom he is having the obligations for the loan financing. And we are mitigating through marketing, through communication, and definitely uh, even, even in the moments when the, the service is provided by EasyPay, our contact point calls, calls the, uh, the customer for the approval of the loan and they know it's not calling them. And after the, the loan is disbursed, we call them again uh, to ask like a um, uh, customer satisfaction and the welcome call that we provide. So uh, they know permanently they are in contact from our contact point in order to really understand mm -hmm. that they, they have the link for, for that loan with Noah. Um, KYC aspects sometimes might be loosened because um, while we have our staff being trained all the time about the AML and all your customer, the identification, uh, to train 460 agents in the field that not, not necessarily everybody has the economic background requires more focus from our side and might bring some, uh, some uh, I would say, uh, uh, small risks. But this requires from our side, as I said, huge trainings, direct contacts with the, with the agents from our people in the respective locations, and a permanent follow-up and monitoring of the customer through, through the phone calls. But the most important, the majority is in the benefit side rather than in the, uh, in the risk. I don't see poaching the customers. Uh, it was not by coincidence that we have chosen EasyPay. There mm -hmm. are other uh, payment institutions in Albania operating, but um, they have behind a bank or they have a license for credit, which is not the case in this case. And to take a license for credit requires months. So if, if our partner will enter into such a process that might perceive as a risk from us, we have time to see what other alternatives to provide for, uh, for the customers by the end. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, uh, the important thing is that we have externalized the services that uh, we think might be beneficial for a fast service um, uh, and bringing the customers more, more close to, to our product in a more easy way, even outside of the reach of our branches. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have entered and we want to further develop uh, on that aspect. But did you see, for example, that your, your branches are weaker or the people feel that some of the tasks have been taken away from them? Do you see the, 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 the does it kind of change the, the, the importance of the branch system? Uh, yes, it is a question mark all the time. What's the future? Yeah, what's <laughs> so, the future? <laughs> whether, whether this new cooperation is going to replace the old method that we are uh, we have been operating for the whole period. But um, no, in fact, uh, we, we have um, established quite very frequent communication on each deal, on each partnership, exactly because we want to show to our people that we don't want to be a fintech company fully operating um, mm. in a digital way because the market is not ready. And it's, I don't see the market. Uh, in the next five years uh, to be ready for a full fintech and distant marketing. So we will keep our traditional um, operations with our loan officers, but fully digitalized because uh, in fact, they operate from tablets. Even the loan process with our loan officers, it is fully automatic and digitalized through tablets and the scoring. But we add additional, uh, additional tools in order to receive much more applications for them uh, to be focused on assessing the application rather than just being in the field and searching for the customer. So this is the explanation that we have provided. All these uh, referrals will help them to process more loans and increase their capacity in processing more loans um, in a day-to-day. Yeah, thank you so much. So it's it's good to know, first of all, it's good to know that you're managing the risk, obviously, but that you recognize those risks and nothing comes without the risk and costs. So yeah, so th th that's a very important thing to keep in mind that no matter what we do, th there's always uh, th there was a risk that we have to be aware of. I would like to go back now, uh, turn to Ilya. I mean, operating, you've seen some questions, people are asking, hey, we, you have operating as a group ecosystem, whatever you call it. Obviously, has as you mentioned, cost. But as, as, do you see some risks in operating, kind of going very broad as a, as an institution? Do you think you're going too broad? Is it is it is it too much? And what, what are the risks of, of managing such a comp complex enterprise? Well, do you or do you well, do you have to manage the whole ecosystem right like this? <laughs> you have to be unmuted, Justina, again, the master of unmuting. <laughs> Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, 
Sorry. So, uh, yes, uh, I mean, to, to continue maybe on uh, what Herr Her Yolo was saying, uh, we do see um, possibly the, the same type of risks in the sense of uh, uh, the brand presence issue, uh, whether it's crystal or who is providing the service, the, the, those types of risks certainly do exist. Um, the, the way we did manage this is by incorporating almost everywhere probably our, our brand presence, you know, strategy, mm -hmm. the communication is very strong, that this is Crystal providing those services. Uh, and, you know, there's the same logo everywhere, basically all the addresses and emails and call centers and things like this. With a payment service provider, we, we specifically chosen someone who is not actually connected to the bank. So it's an independent PSP because otherwise, mm -hmm. we, despite all the data protection laws and everything, you, you're always running that risk, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what I do see uh, is increasing complexity, probably one of the major things uh, there. Because, uh, I mean, Georgian financial sector, it's heavily regulated. It's probably one of the heaviest regulated sectors in Eastern Europe. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why we also did this is because we were we would be simply unable to provide all the services that our customers mm -hmm. need, right? So going on a strategic relationship with a PSP, finding it, you know, working with them, doing all those integrations, which is pretty costly thing because it has to be seamless for the customer. The customer does not really know whether they're actually doing their transaction Mm. At, an, at a PSP, yes, they're signing papers, but uh, they don't care. I mean, it's crystal in the end. So mm. all of that had to be seamless. You have to adhere to a number of different regulations for PSP, for the lending, for the customer protection, for customer information, data keeping. So, so all of that. Leasing, same story. So you have to you know, address the leasing regulations. You have to look at a different tax regime because leasing in Georgia is VAT based, unfortunately, uh, compared to many European countries. So all of that is obviously adding some complexity, but uh, I believe I mean, there's no other way to develop rather than you know, accept that challenge and, and go mm. forward. Okay. Thank you very much, Ilya. And I have the, and again, I will come back to now to Teodora. Do you see any risks in, in, in Justina, you have to unmute Teodora now. <laughs> Unless you can, do you see any risk, especially when you start introducing more uh, MFIs into the platforms? Is, is it, is it going, is it going to help the, uh, obviously it may help the customer, is it going to create more competition? How, well, do you see any risks in introducing platforms like this? Yes, actually, it's a very, very good point, especially with adding uh, different um, different institutions, because the risk here that we see is that at some point, maybe all the offerings might become a little bit similar or the same. So if a product is uh, more interesting for the customers, the rest will try to adapt and um, adjust theirs according to it. So, we see this um, this risk. We still cannot say if this is a real uh, real mm. scenario or not, but we we think that it might be the case. Then it will be maybe more on a platform administration and organizational level to manage this. Um, I have a question. If I might, if I just one clarification, uh, is the intention of this platform? Or is it is the idea that the, there will be, for example, several potentially financial institutions competing for the client, but anonymously without revealing who they are. So the, the, the customer kind of asks, uh, makes, makes an offer, is looking for, for financing, and then the, is, it, is it open or is, is it would be the identity of the financial institution would be revealed? Because that potentially can make a difference. Uh, it can't be at 100% revealed because at some point uh, they will get to to contact and so on but yes the idea is to keep this uh, more on a second not, level yeah. and the primary to be a competition on conditions and uh, prices for the end customers and so to have the best offerings for the end customers and not uh, the vice versa okay so it does become a kind of it is a, it is a service for for the for the client and and almost a, a kind of a competitive tool for competition or, or getting the best offers yeah that's, least, it, that's the intention the pure idea yeah yeah, yeah it's okay yeah there's risks of course okay 
we, we have actually come to the uh, one hour and a half. I think uh, we, uh, we have tried to present uh, today three different kind of approaches, kind of evolving approaches of business model that, that they move away from solo operations to more kind of collaborative uh, ways of, of doing business. And we have, uh, at least in my mind, we have present, uh, I was trying to categorize them as process oriented, which Ariola was talking about, and you know, the, the disaggregating the process into different components and taking it into potentially uh, creating partnerships with institutions. Ilya from Crystal was talking about the, the model that actually the, the, the institution is building ecosystem around through partnerships in a, in a different way. And Teodora was showing how we can actually, uh, how, uh, you, how we can create an ecosystem build on a specific need of a, of a, of a client. I hope that um, this has been somewhat uh, uh, illuminating or, or showing how uh, our this business models and microfinance institutions can evolve because in Theodora's case, in the Bulgarian case, obviously the, the role of institutions, how, how they market, how they, also the business, how the microfinance institutions would do business using such platforms would change. So uh, each of those models uh, hopefully gives us some ideas. Um, what, first of all, what's happening, what can be done. Uh, we don't have time for this, but I would ask people uh, how uh, each of you would actually use, is, is it useful? Hariola, one quick question. Would, you, uh, would it be interesting from, from, to use? What would be interesting for you from the other two models? <laughs> I couldn't hear up to the end. Can you repeat, please? Yes, the question, the quick question to you. Uh, you have heard, two, apart from your model, two other models. What, what's interesting? Is there anything that you would pick from those for your for your own benefit? Would you, yes. would you, would you, would you, would you take something out of this? <laughs> uh, yes, of course. In fact, um, uh, why we're doing all this, I would say, outsourcing now of, your, of the current operations, which at a certain level now we consider them uh, as a low value for no after. 22 years of, of operating yeah. the, the credit granting because we are preparing ourselves in um, uh, providing additional services to our customers. We are just establishing the foundation of NOAA. In fact, we are following a similar example of Crystal. We're establishing a foundation of NOAA uh, to handle the non-financial products or services. So all our um, non-financial products will be channeled to this foundation uh, and will be uh, provided to our customers free of any charge. Uh, yeah. at, at the first stage. Later, we'll see if we will expand it uh, also to the non-customers, but initially we will test it with our customers. Uh, definitely, we are evaluating additional services. So apart from the payments that we are operating mm -hmm. with EDP, uh, we are having uh, two um, uh, projects uh, in pipeline for the end of this year, uh, like the micro insurances and the micro pensions. Uh, uh, we are all the time evaluating the market to start uh, providing those services with um, uh, the companies that have the expertise and us to be the distributors at an initial stage until the moment we gain the expertise and we think maybe we can provide it ourselves. But we like a lot to, to, to provide services with the key experts. We cannot do all the time everything yeah. ourselves. So we are good at what we are and uh, any additional service in order to be very good and the same good for the customer needs to have the knowledge, the setup and all the, yeah. all the expertise of, of, um, of the others. So yes, I would. Okay, so there is a, there is a way. Okay, so there are, there are opportunities to mix and match the, the different components. Ilya, what about you? Would you, would you? Is anything that's inspiring from the other models or what other people are doing <laughs> that you can borrow? <laughs> Of course, um, there, there, there certainly is, I think, a very uh, interesting how uh, the, the, both, all three models were presented. Uh, maybe the, the, the partnerships uh, and outsourcing would be something that we would like to develop a bit more because uh, our traditional approach has been do almost everything by ourselves. And that, that's not always an easy one, especially when there's so much spe specialization in coming mm. into, into different uh, things, um, especially when it comes to you know, uh, technology and software development uh, part. So basically we're doing everything on our own, uh, mm. which you know, comes with its own benefits because we do it with a lot of agility and speed uh, but but there are certain limits to this. So at, mm. at some point in time, we probably will be you know doing more div divesting more of the activities in a sense to to other um, or, or building you know such integrated platforms. 
So again, there are opportunities for, for, for mixing, uh, uh, borrowing from different models. Theodora, you have heard two uh, mature, actually, MFIs and how they operate. Anything that you see that you would include in your platform now that you've heard what they do? So uh, actually, yes, uh, it's very interesting to hear real uh, business scenarios and real mm -hmm. uh, cases uh, from, the, from the MFIs. And here, for sure, uh, we see that uh, the approach that we are taking is on the right way in automating as much as uh, possible processes and uh, trying to build the user journeys in a way that they're closer to the end customer and easier for them to to proceed and so on. So uh, yes, it's uh, really, really beneficial for us to see all this and uh, see where we can uh, still be of help. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to thank, okay, we are really up, uh, be almost, be, uh, not almost, we actually uh, uh, positively beyond time. So I would like to thank all the speakers. <laughs> Um, Heriola, Teodora, Idia for, for participating. I would like to thank, uh, kudos to uh, uh, Lisa and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. Justina, back to you. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, I launched the poll uh, to the participants about the, their uh, interest and uh, questions about uh, the ecosystem. So uh, we received some responses already. Uh, can you see? Mm, the responses? Probably not. Uh, yes, 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 I okay. do. Uh, yes, I do. But it's interesting to see that the the uh, everybody everybody wants yeah. to have customer centric. So it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how. Uh, how so Dora, I think you will have some clients to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's that's about the impressions of uh, uh, our uh, participants and. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, all the speakers. Thank you, Lisa, for uh, introducing the objectives of the, the MasterCard and the project. Uh, please let me just uh, show you a slide with the upcoming webinars. So as, as I mentioned in the beginning, we, had, we have three more webinars in the coming weeks, and uh, you can already register. Uh, the link to the registration is in the bottom of the page and uh, after the end of the webinar I will send you all of this uh, link again together with the presentation um, from this webinar so uh, have a look later on in, in your uh, inboxes you will uh, receive the link and the presentation uh, so that is all uh, from us. So thank you very much again to the speakers and uh, to the participants who attended uh, the webinar. If there are any other questions and comments, please uh, contact us uh, via email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.